of the Lord. And let me add what a blessing it is to be seen by you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And these days that are challenging our health, we are grateful to the Lord that he allows us to be where we are. Amen. Amen. We've gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our main reason. And that's what we're going to do. Would you please stand with me as we begin our time of worship by the quoting of God's word. And you'll find our Bible verses on the screen or on your bulletin. Let's say them all together aloud. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Remain standing as the ladies lead us in song. Sing along with them, and let's lift up the name of Jesus. And we know we have a hope. Don't yes, we? Amen. <laughs> Oh 
Joshua Dobbins and the son Noah. Thank y'all so much. May we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for waking us up today, Lord. Lord, we thank you for putting the air in our lungs, Lord. Yes. Lord, we thank you for helping us to have a greater day, Lord. And for those, Lord, who are able to get out of bed today, Lord, we ask that you please wrap your arms around them, Lord. Yes, Lord. We ask that you please give them the health in which they need to have a better day and go about it, Lord. And Lord, we pray and ask today that Pastor Cook will enlighten our hearts, Lord, with his praise, Lord. Lord, help we ask Lord. that you give him the right words yes. Yes, to help, help, help us Lord. today, Lord. And Lord, we ask, pray and ask that you know, we will go about our week this, this week, Lord, with joy and happiness. Yes. So that we will you know, have, have a great time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Noah. And you may be seated as we look at our announcements, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering is $333 short of our $2,500 Praise the Lord goal. Now, you met the Amen goal, you met the Hallelujah goal, but our largest goal, the Praise the Lord goal, is still to be met. And if somebody would write a check for $333 this morning, we'll make that goal and we'll say Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, though, seriously, how you've been giving. These have been challenging times physically, they've been challenging times mentally and financially, but you've been meeting our goals, and this is wonderful. Thank you so much for how you give. Our church council has been postponed for today to a later date to be announced. Next Sunday, we'll be recognizing the sanctity of human life. Every life is precious from the womb to the tomb. Yes. And I'm going to be preaching on that, and I appreciate you lifting me up in prayer for that special time. After the worship service, we'll have our fourth quarter of ministry reports. Uh, some of you from old school, that's a church conference, time that we make a report to the church about all the ministries and including the financial status of the church. And so everybody's invited. And then two <coughs> weeks from now is our 63rd homecoming celebration. And our special guests are Kim and Joe Stanley. Y'all remember Brother Joe back yes, a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago and how he led us in song? 
Well, he's only half of that tandem team of the, and he's he's not the better half either. Now, you're going to be blessed when Sister Kim shows up. You don't want to miss it. And let our former members know, get the word out, and we're going to have a great time celebrating what God has done here at Victory Baptist Church for 63 years and hopefully for more years to come until our Lord and Savior Jesus returns. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord. We're grateful for your attendance, and I thank you that for your prayers that we, uh, Carla and I have been missing last uh, two Sundays, and uh, she has to miss this thing. She's three or four days behind me in catching that COVID and recovering, and she's just not feeling up to it this morning. And I appreciate your prayer for her. Others have had it. I just found out. Uh, Brother Joshua's come through it. And then there's others in our church that experience it. And then some, they're just afraid to get out. And this thing is very challenging mentally. And I don't want you to fear it. God is greater than all Amen. anything that comes against us. And uh, though we need to be smart about it. And those of you who are guests this morning, returning members, God bless you. I want to introduce a special guest to you this morning. One of my high school buddies, Brother Charles Mizell. Brother Charlie, you raise your hand. We called him Charlie back in school. He said it's all right to call him Charlie. So if I slip up and call him Charlie, he said that's okay. And uh, Brother Charles just had a great reputation in high school being one of the smart guys. He was one of the guys that you want to get help you with your homework or sit next to him when you had a test. Just in case your eyes wandered over on his paper to see what he put down. And so we welcome Brother Charles. He just retired too, and we just celebrate his life and appreciate you, Brother Charles, for being here. What a blessing. Let's all stand and just remain where you are and turn to one another. No handshaking, but a lot of hand waving and smiles behind those masks. Amen. God bless you. Welcome one another in the name of the Lord. And it sure is good to have Sister Cook back with us too. Y'all be in prayer for her husband, Brother Bailey. Long time members here founders, or not founders, but uh, good pillars and yes. foundations of this church for a long time. Well, let's remain standing, and ladies continue to lead us in singing. That was some good singing I heard from y'all back there. Let's hear some more. Amen. Man of sorrows, what a name for the
What a friend we have. Yeah. 
through some of these times, even though we've gone through trials, even we've gone through the COVID. Dear Lord, you've seen us through. Amen. You just brought us right on Thank through. You, and even if you haven't brought us on through, if you know him, if you have been Amen. saved and you have a friend of God, that you that friend of God, you will be with him. Amen. So you're not losing anything. It's all gain, Amen. all the way, as Amen. long as you're a friend of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Lynn. Thank you, ladies. Amen. I don't know if I can follow that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all may be seated. Amen. Thank you. That Jesus is a friend. And as they're coming down to be seated, thank you, ladies. You may take your copy of God's Word and join me in 3 John. 3 John, that's way over in the end almost to the book of the revelation all you have is jude in between third john and it's right after second john amen and i want to speak to you this morning about the prospering of your soul i wish above all things that your soul prospers that you prosper and there's nothing more important than our soul Someone has defined the soul as the mind, will, and emotions. But in New Testament theology, it also includes our spirit. And sometimes we are defined as a tripart being. That is, we're body. Everybody recognizes the body. That's the outward appearance that we have. Something that is tangible. We can touch it. We can see it. Sometimes if we don't take a bath, we can smell it. Amen? The body. And then you have what some divide between the soul and the spirit in making a distinction. The soul being the mind, will, and emotions. That intellect, that part of you that thinks and has logic and tries to exercise logic. That part of you that uh, makes you happy and then makes you sad. And then there's that which is spirit that makes us distinct and exclusive from any other of the creations of God. For an example, a plant has a body. And take an old collard green plant, and take an old rose bush. It has a body, but it doesn't have a soul, mind, will, or emotions, nor does it have a spirit. You take an animal like a dog or a horse, it has a body, it has a mind, will, and emotion. It uses logic. You pat a dog on the head and it is happy. You kick it and it yelps and it's sad. That is its soul. But an animal has no spirit in the sense <coughs> that you will never see a dog fall down on its knees, lift its head toward heaven in prayer. That is something that we as humans have, and God has created us special. The first five days of creation, he created everything other than human beings, and then on the sixth day, he said, let us create man in our image. Using the plural in reference to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, and that is that part of us not that we look like God physically, but we have the characteristics of God, and we're able to commune with him, our spirit, with his spirit. And as the song reminded us, Jesus no longer calls us servants, but he calls us friends, and he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. During this time of, of holiday, that is the Christmas season, when we recognize the incarnation of God, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, and they called his name Jesus because he saves us from our sins. And then the new year, we've been wishing one another a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And our desire is that we might prosper in the new year. Now, there is a request made of John the Elder, 
the one who wrote the book of John in the uh, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and whom we believe also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Apostle John. And it is a request that is made to Gaius, and he's saying, Gaius, I'm praying for you that you may prosper. But he says it in a way that causes us to sit up and pay a little attention because he says, I pray that you will prosper bodily as you have prospered spiritually. Now, I want you to think about that kind of prayer. If somebody came up to you and said, listen, I'm going to pray that you prosper physically as much as you are prospering spiritually. Would you want that kind of prayer? And you might say, why wouldn't I want that kind of prayer? Well, if you're not prospering spiritually, then you may not be prospering healthily, uh, physically, and that physical health, if you're not prospering spiritually. It's like the guy who was being sought for a job, and the prospective company really wanted him. They told him, listen, we'll pay you what you're worth. And he said, no, no, so I'm getting more than that where I'm at now. And they're paying me more than that. And so when you think about somebody coming up to you and saying, I'm going to pray for you that you'll prosper physically as much as you're doing spiritually, you might have a double uh, thought there thinking, I don't know about that. Just pray that I'll be good spiritually and physically because I'm not doing that well spiritually. This is the testimony of this Gaius that we'll be introduced to in these 14 verses of 3 John. You might be looking at 3 John, verses 1 through 14. You're saying, well, what chapter are we in? It's just a short book. It's only 14 verses, and so we don't make reference to the chapter. But in addition to Gaius, there's two other characters that are mentioned in these short 14 verses. You'll be introduced to the man Diotrephes, and then Demetrius. And I want you to pay attention to what John the Apostle says concerning three, these three men, and then especially the request that John makes for Gaius. Begin with me in verse 1 of 3 John. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. The elder, again, is in reference to John the Apostle, and he calls Gaius his beloved. These are two good friends. He not only had, not only did they have a friendship with Jesus, but you'll discover when you have a friendship with Jesus, you'll have a friendship with all others who have a friendship with Jesus. That's what binds us together. In verse 2, he continues, he said, Beloved, in reference to Gaius, I wish or I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So what we can see here is that John is praying for Gaius that he prosper health-wise, uh, that is physically in his health, as well as he is doing spiritually. So it may be some indication here that Gaius was not doing well physically. He may have had some illness, or he may have something that was besetting him physically, and so he's praying for his physical health. Now, we know about that in these days, do we not? Our concern is on our physical health with the COVID and the virus and everything that's going around. And even without that, the older we get, the more we are concerned about our health. We just ain't what we used to be, right? And it gets a little harder to get up every morning. It used to be we'd get up in the morning every morning and say, good morning, Lord. Now it's starting to change to good Lord, it's morning. We're just not as enthusiastic because our health is failing us. And one day we will go the way of all flesh. And if you were to pay attention to most prayer request, it's about our physical health, isn't it? Pray that I'll get to feeling better. Pray that I won't get sick. Pray that I won't get this COVID. Pray for my physical health. And this is exactly what John is doing for Gaius, but he makes that little qualification there. He says, I pray that you'll prosper physically as much as you're prospering spiritually. So what does that tell us about Gaius? He was someone who was walking close to the Lord. He was a spiritual giant, at least in comparison with others, because it was noted that he was prospering spiritually. Listen to what it says more about him as we continue in verse 3. John says, For I rejoice, great, rejoice greatly 
when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so John is saying here, said, it's come to me by testimony of the brethren that you are walking in truth and it just rejoices my soul. And he makes reference to Gaius as one of his children. John being the elder would have had those under his charge that he had brought in to the faith. And evidently this is speaking to Gaius as one of his converts. Now we know that we don't convert anybody. It's the Holy Spirit who converts. But it was John who led him to the Lord. And he refers to him as his children. Let me ask you as a Christian and as a Christian of many years. Do you have any children? Do you have any spiritual children? Can you refer to somebody that you have led to the Lord? If not, get busy. If not, start witnessing. If not, tell others about Jesus so that when your time comes, when you get into heaven and they'll say, where's your family? You don't have to look down with sadness and regret saying, I'm the only one here. No, birth those others into the family of God that need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they may be born again and they can be credited to your witness just as John credited Gaius to his witness by calling him his child. And then he continues in verse 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Now he's making reference here not only to his close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful testimony he had from the brethren about his living in the truth, following the ways of the Lord, but he's making reference here to how he treats those who are evangelists, those who are traveling preachers, and even strangers. Gaius had the gift of hospitality. He not only entertained those by having them in his house who were witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, but he helped them on their way. That is, he supported them. Look what he says in verse 6. Those that you have supported, they have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for this, or for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Again, John is making reference to the testimony of Gaius, and not only how he talked the talk, but he walked the talk too. He took in those who came into his area. They didn't have the holiday inns and the places they could stay back then. And it was dependent, and they were dependent on other Christians to take them in, to house them, and to take care of their needs and send them on their way because they had a very important mission. Did you catch that in verse 7? Because that for his name's sake, they went forward. These were men who were going forth in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to witness the, uh, the faith that was found in Jesus Christ that men might be saved. Now listen, if you take your checkbook, those of you still use a checkbook, or if you take your statement from the bank, and if you were to go down that statement, and as some credit card companies do, and as some banks do, and they itemize those things that you've spent your money on, what is it that you've been supporting most? You say, well, first of all, I've been supporting my mortgage company. <laughs> and then it's the car payment. But after those things, what have you been supporting most? If someone were to take your checkbook, so to speak, and go down your register of your expenses, could they determine from what you spend your money on and invest that you're a Christian. Would there be an entry every week where you've taken the first tenth of your income and given it to God? Or are you stealing from God? You see, the tithe belongs to the Lord. We don't give the tithe, we just return it. God says it all belongs to me, but all I'm asking you for is one tenth. I was reading the story of Dr. Joe McKeever in one of the experiences with his grandson who was seven years old. His grandson had come over to visit. His name was Grant. And he walked into his papa's bedroom and he saw all this change 
in a change jar. And he said, Papa, what's that? He said, well, that's change that I put in, out of my pocket and put in there and just save it up. So what do you do with it? He said, well, sometimes I give it to missions, and his papa was a preacher. Sometimes I give it to somebody that might uh, need it and help them out. Hey, Grant, I've got an idea. I said, would you like to have that? And his, his little eyes just bugged out like that. I said, yeah. He said, well, go talk to your mom and daddy about it and what you're going to do with it, and papa will give you the money. So long story short, he gave him the money, and his daddy and Grant were sitting there counting out the money, and Dr. McKeever said come up about $30. And they had decided that little Grant would give a tenth to the Lord, would put a tenth in savings, and then he could spend the rest. And Papa, Dr. McKeever, said he went by and he saw little Grant taking that money, all those pennies and nickels and dimes, and he had three little jars separated, and the one that was marked for the Lord, every time he took a coin and put it in there, he just kind of held on to it for so long, <laughs> and he just gave a sour face, and said, oh, that's for the Lord. And he thought, how like us. Grant didn't even think about all that was given to him, and he couldn't turn around and give a tenth of it with joy to the Lord. And you and I are just like Grant sometimes when we think, you may not have got to tithe, Friend, you don't get to tithe. You don't got to tithe, have to tithe. You get to tithe. You get to give to the Lord. And not only the tenth, but everything belongs to the Lord. That doesn't mean you spend the other 90% any way you want to. You ought to glorify the Lord in your life and every area of your life, including your finances. And so here's Gaius, and he's taking them in at his expense. He's taking care of their needs, and he's giving them a little traveling money on the way. Because they have a great service to do for others, and that is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great calling to support those. And John commends him for that. Oh, what a wonderful testimony Gaius had. Now, I want you to think about some of those preachers who preach health, wealth, and you can have it all. Some of them say something like this, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. And I want you to notice that Gaius here was had the testimony of being a very spiritual man, and yet he's in poor health. He's a very spiritual man, and yet he gives his money away. You see, it's not always finances that God blesses us with. He can bless us with good health. I was watching an old Alfred Hitchcock movie the other day. These men were out in the desert and they had connived and cheated somebody out of some gold bullion. And they had these gold bricks, just a little bit smaller than uh, a regular brick. And they had to wreck the car that they were in to make it look like an accident that the other guy was in. And they were calculating that they could walk 20 or something miles in that desert to get to the next town and the story would be covered and, and uh, they could take care of everything. And so both of them were laden down with some gold bricks. Well, both of them had a canteen, but one of them lost his. Mm -hmm. And he was dry mouth and thirsty and it was just the two out in the desert and they had realized that they had miscalculated the distance to the next town and one of them wasn't going to make it. And the one that lost his canteen said, please, can I have a drink of your water? And both of them are thieves. And so the other one just smiled and said, you know, I'll give you a drink of water, but it'll cost you one gold brick. And the guy looks at him. And all of a sudden, water became very expensive. And the gold brick wasn't as important as to live in. And he gave a gold brick, and he charged him two gold bricks the next time. The third time he did that, the guy bit down to get the canteen. He took the gold brick and knocked him in the head and killed him. Well, as old Alfred Hitchcock stories end up, both of them wound up dying over that gold brick. And they gave their lives for gold that they couldn't spend. You know what we worship down here like gold will walk on up there, the streets of gold. You see, there's something more important than finances. There's something more important than money, and that's your physical and spiritual health. And when it comes between the two, your spiritual health is more important 
Bible teaches us though the outward man perishes, the inward man grows day by day. And it's that relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ that makes all the difference. And so if somebody were to ask you, so would you like me to pray that your physical health would be as good as your spiritual health? Gives you some thinking, doesn't it? Now look at this next character that will be introduced to Diotrephes. Now, in verse 7, it says, Because for this, his name's sake, that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they go forth, uh, uh, Gaius, and they don't take anything from the Gentiles because, first of all, we don't need anything from the lost to help support the work, the work of the Lord. And we don't need to be having all these sales and cake sales from the lost. God calls his people to support his work. Secondly, when you start taking money from the, uh, the lost, and I make reference to these health and wealth preachers on TV, sometimes a lost person will get the idea, well, if I give this money to the preacher, I've got something in with God. And some of these preachers realize that and take advantage of it, and they sell the gospel. There's a hot place in hell for those type of preachers to take advantage of the lost to merchandise the gospel and not be concerned about their spiritual standing with the Lord. And so they didn't take anything from the Gentiles, not that they are thumbing their nose down to it, but they were saying, listen, our God is able to supply and God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. And now we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And that's just a summation of the uh, testimony of Gaius that John is making here. Now we're introduced to Diotrephes in verse 9. Now I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Now this is comparison of Gaius in the church and how he's responding to those in need and Diotrephes in the church. He asserted himself, and it was a self-assertion, that he did not have the authority to do so. And he says the Atrophies didn't receive them. Matter of fact, he turned some out of the church who did receive them. Listen to this. Wherefore, if I come, I will, will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us. And that word prating is uh, interpreted, meaning that he was just saying all kinds of evil and wicked things against us and is a malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Can you imagine that? Having the preacher leading the church, or leader in the church, that doesn't receive those in the church, uh, coming to the church, and support those who are trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he says, and if I find any of your others doing that, I'm going to kick you out of the church. Can you believe that? Well, believe it. I was part of a church about 40 years ago that had built a brand new gymnasium and had shower facilities, a kitchen, and all kinds of facilities. And I sat in a meeting where it was discussed whether or not we were going to entertain a youth group coming through town that could use that facility, use their... Uh, sleeping bags, sleep in that gym, use the, the kitchen and use all those facilities. And some of them said something like this, we built this church for our members and they didn't have them. Can you imagine a church doing that? Folks, when you talk about the church, you're not talking about a perfect place because there's not a perfect place with perfect people, but we serve a perfect God. And one of the reasons we meet is to be instructed in the Word of God, to be encouraged in the Word of God, to be directed by the Word of God. And if so be the Word of God convicts you, convicts you is to repent at the Word of God and get right with God. And when we get right with God, we'll get right with one another and realize that all that we have belongs to Him and it belongs to those of those that need it. Now, we're not forced to do that. We're not a socialist or communist organization. We are a Christian church, and we give what we have. And that indicates ownership. God recognizes ownership, and we give out of the willingness of our heart. 
thinking about the one who gave all he had for those of us who had nothing. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 11 says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil. Don't be like the Diotrephes. Be like Gaius. But that which is good, he that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Makes sense to me, right? You know God who is good, you ought to be doing good deeds. You say you know God, but you're doing evil. Something isn't matching up there. Now, we're introduced to Demetrius, and I must hurry so y'all listen fast, all right? Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself, meaning that he had a good testimony among all men. Why do you have a good testimony with all men? Because they have seen your good works, you've treated them well, and they speak well of you. How many of you want people to speak well of you? All right, what do you think that's going to take? You're treating them well. But he says that he's also spoken well of by the truth. Now, what is the truth? It's the word of God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's not only the written word, but it's the living word. And he lived in obedience to the written word of God and in worship of the living word of God. And the truth spoke well of him. And that's where our walk has to match our talk. And for Demetrius, that was true. Yea, and we also bear record, and you know our record is true. Now, he sums up the letter by saying, I have many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet thee, the friends. Greet the friends by name. Now, whenever you have somebody says, you know, I need to see you face to face. We don't need to be writing or texting or talking on the telephone. I need to see you face to face. Do you usually have an easy feeling about that or a little nervous feeling about that? Mm -hmm. The preacher says, I need to see you and we need to talk face to face. That makes you feel good or that makes it, oh, what's he got on? What's that? Is he getting mad at me? Or somebody says, preacher, I need to talk to you face to face. I'm wondering, what did I say from the pulpit? Did I offend somebody? Usually we think of it in the negative, but I think here that John wanted to speak to them face to face because he would have, they, he wanted to see that smile on their face. They wouldn't have to wear a mask back then. And he wanted to smile, I, I believe he wanted them to see that twinkle in his eye and to see the sincere appreciation exuded from him for how they had been living. John was encouraging them. Now I want to sum this up with this thought. If I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that, God, I want you to bless their physical being as much as their spiritual being, would you be happy with that prayer request right now and that kind of prayer? If not, I want you to listen to just a few things. Now, we're comparing the physical with the spiritual. When it comes to physical health, we know that at least three things are essential. We need to eat properly, correct? You need to eat the proper foods. And uh, you know about diet and how that diet can affect your physical health. You know that you also have to exercise. Movement is the medicine. And then you have to get proper rest. Uh, some of the studies that I've been reading, we're not getting our rest like we should. We're not sleeping long enough. We should be sleeping seven or eight hours. I dare say most of us didn't get seven or eight hours last night or any night this week, but you should be resting well. Now, if that's true in the physical realm, it is also true in the spiritual realm. We need to eat well. How do we feed our spiritual being? you got to feed it with spiritual food. What is the spiritual food? It's the Word of God. And the Bible makes reference to the Word of God as being the milk of the Word and the meat of the Word, even very strong meat. Now, you're in 3 John, if you can with me real quickly, just turn a few books over to the book of Hebrews and look at chapter 5, and I'm going to read from verse 12. If you can't find that, just listen carefully. This is the writer of Hebrews saying in verse 12, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is getting on to the Hebrews and saying, listen, you haven't matured as much as you should have. You need to be teaching the oracles or the word of God 
but you still have need for others to teach you. There's a, there's a disconnect here. And he goes on to say, and become such as have need of milk. Your grown adults, spiritually speaking, you've lived long enough to be a grown adult, but instead of eating adult spiritual food, you're still sucking on the milk of the word. Now, we would understand the significance of that if we saw a 30-year-old man still walking around sucking on a bottle, wouldn't we? Well, that's exactly the picture that the writer of Hebrews is saying here. It says, you're old enough to be eating the meat of the word and you're still sucking on the milk of the word. Listen to how he says it in the latter part. And you become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And so when we feed this spiritual being, you have to feed it with spiritual food. And just as if you did not eat physical food for several days and you would become weak, W-E-A-K, if you don't feed your spirit with the Word of God, you'll become W-E-A-K. You'll become weak. And you need to move from the milk of the Word, which is the foundational teachings and ordinances of the Word of God, into the deeper things of God. Get in the book of Romans. You'll be eating on some meat. You'll be chewing on some fat for a long time. And you need to eat the strong meat because those of us who are getting older are not necessarily Christians uh, more mature. We've just gone through the first year of maturity, 10 or 15 or 20 or 40 years. We've never really matured. So get into the Word and let the Word get into you. To spiritually prosper, you need to eat well. Feast on the Word of God. Now, there's one parallel that you can't make exactly because if I eat too much physically, I get too big and lethargic. But you can't eat too much spiritually. Feast on all the Word of God you want to and come back not only for seconds and thirds, all the helpings you want Eat it all. Secondly, to prosper spiritually, you need to exercise. How do you exercise spiritually? Well, look again at what he says in verse 3 concerning Gaius. He says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. That word walk is a euphemism for living out the truth that he had learned. Listen, the Bible is not given just for information. It is not given just for inspiration, but it is given for us to a application, to apply it to our lives. Uh, Charlie asked me about being on the football team in high school. Uh, he, he, he was one of the smart ones, so he wasn't so up to date on the football team. We were just the dumb jocks going around, and he was the smart one. So he said, what position did you play? And I said, well, believe it or not, it was uh, quarterback on the offense, cornerback on the defense. Younger, slimmer days. <laughs> and we used to have what we called skull meetings. Before we'd go out on the practice field sometimes, coach would take us in the classroom and he would draw up on the chalkboard. You know what I found out? It was so much easier to draw up a play on the chalkboard and run it with that chalk against a opposition and score a touchdown every time. I mean, he would draw it up and he said, this guy blocks that guy and that guy blocks that guy. Cook, you take the ball and turn it and hand it off him and he'll run up between this hole and he'll score a touchdown. We got all enthused, went out there and then we realized that uh, the other team had a chalk talk too. And they just weren't willing to lay down and let us run through their line. You had some opposition and so we had to apply what we learned in the classroom out on the football field. We could have stayed in the classroom and won every game on the chalkboard. But that really doesn't count, does it? You've got to let the Word of God get in you. Learn the Word of God, then apply the Word of God in your lives. Take that tithe that I was talking about a while ago. You say, well, I know I'm supposed to give. We'll start giving. I would tell you no more not to give than I would tell you not to pray because it's part of your worship. It belongs to God. 
God doesn't need your money, and His church really doesn't need your money in the sense we got to have it. But if we're going to be in the kingdom of God, it belongs to Him, and He can use it for the furtherance of His kingdom, like supporting those people who come through. I remember when I was taking a trip to Romania, and I was taking a, a mission group with me, and I was in charge of them, four or five people. That's a pretty big responsibility. And I'd only been there one other time, and I'd been under somebody else's leadership. Now I'm the guy that's the leader. And we had to lay over in London, and I was trying to work out some things. And I just happened to have a visiting evangelist with me, uh, Anise Sharosh, who was from Palestine, had contacts all over the world. And he was pulling out of the parking lot of the hotel where we put him up to leave for the week, and I just happened to mention that trip. And I said, I'm going to have to call somebody in London to try to find out if we can get some hotel or something over there. And he said, London? He said, I've got a good friend. Akhtar Samuel, a converted Palestinian that had a, uh, not Palestinian, Pakistani, that had a ministry over there. And he led me to Akhtar and his wife, Jean, and then another preacher's wife over in London. And they were able to put us up for a night. And then, thankfully, the preacher's wife was able to put us on the tube, they call over the subway, and get us on that. There were so many getting on and offs, we'd still be over there 20 years later if it wasn't for her. And they took care of us, and they said, they did the same thing that Gaius did. They helped us because we had a mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the Romanians, with the Hungarians, and with the gypsies of Romania. And what a wonderful service they did for us. And so they knew all the way. They put it into practice. You know to pray. You need to put it into practice. You know to love your neighbor. You need to put it in practice. You know to show favoritism to everybody. That Therefore, you're not showing favoritism to anybody. But in our racial injustice, you know to be fair and trusting to everybody. Now, you know that. But again, the scripture is not just for information or inspiration, but it's for application. Do it. Exercise. Then, to spiritually prosper, just like physically prospering, you need to eat well on the Word of God. You need to exercise well by applying the Word of God to your life and your walk with the Lord. And then you need to rest well. Now, preacher, I can rest well. <laughs> I can sleep. I have no trouble doing that. Well, when you rest Spiritually speaking, you don't go to sleep. Matter of fact, it's the opposite. Awake, my soul. Uh, the days are drawing near when the coming of the Lord is, is, is arriving on the scene and judgment to this world is coming. And you might be frightened. Well, this is where your rest comes in. You rest in the confidence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what we try to do sometimes? We try to garner God's favor. We try to earn God's favor. We try to do something to make God like us more. And we're never at ease and never at rest if that is our mindset and our heart set to somehow, some way, please God by something that we do. Let me remind you that when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. Everything that you and I need to be saved, to receive the forgiveness of God and the salvation of God was accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Jesus shed his blood to cover you and to cleanse you from A-L-L, -L, all your sin. It is finished. And when we rest in Jesus, what we do is we put fully, wholly, completely, entirely, exclusively our faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us, knowing that he says, I will receive all who come unto me, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you realize that, it's like a ton of, of weight off your shoulders and you can finally rest in the Lord knowing he's done it all 
You don't have to do anything but continue to believe in him and trust in him. That is rest in Jesus. Rest from relying on your good works. Rest from relying on your morality. Rest from your church ritual and membership. Rest trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Rest in Jesus who has done it all for you. Oh, I pray that your physical health may prosper as well as your spiritual health. And I hope your spiritual health is out of this world. Would you please stand with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me ask you, how are you prospering spiritually speaking? Preacher, <laughs> I don't think I'm eating as well as I can. I, I need to get in that word of God. I've been sucking on a bottle too long. I need to get into the meat. But let me encourage you to be faithful in worship services. Bring your Bible with you. During the week, read your Bible and study your Bible. If you haven't picked up one of these Sunday School Quarterlies, that is your personal study guide, there are some still out on the table in the vestibule. Pick one of them up. There are millions, maybe, Bible studies online that you can study. If you don't know, ask me. Eat well. Then exercise well. Don't just leave the worship service on Sunday morning and then go about business as usual Monday through Saturday. Ask God, God, what is it that you want me to take from this worship service this morning? What is it that you want me to not only learn but to apply to my life? What is it that God has said to you this morning? Then put it into practice this week. You may not get it right the first time, but you keep practicing. The more we practice, the better we become. The more we exercise, the stronger we get. And then rest in Jesus. Know full well, completely, wholly, entirely, that Jesus has done it all. And all you need to do is put your faith where God placed your sins on Jesus. Say, dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I know I don't deserve it, but you love me enough to die for me anyways. Oh, what love. And I accept that love, and I believe with all my heart, there's nothing I can do about my salvation, but you've done it all for me, and I place my faith and trust in you. Oh, you're so good, God. Thank you for saving me. For the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe God has spoken to you in another way. Then you be obedient. And for those of you who have never given your heart to Jesus, or you need a time of prayer up front, Sister Lynn is coming up, and she's going to lead us in what we call the hymn of invitation. God wants you to publicly profess your faith for him, to let your testimony be known among the brethren that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus. To follow through with baptism later on, Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus does. Baptism simply says on the outside what's happened to you on the inside. You've died with Jesus. You've been buried with him. You've been raised in newness of life. If that's you, then would you come this morning, meet me down front as we sing this hymn of invitation just for you and maybe for another reason God's calling you. Would you come? Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you, Lord, that you're a God who has made us body, soul, and spirit. And you're able to prosper us in all three. Thank you for Jesus who paid it all. In his name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll meet you down front. Would you meet me? God's calling you right now as the music plays. <laughs>
Have you? Has there been a time in your life that you cast yourself at the mercy of the Lord Jesus who died on that cross in a place called Calvary? If not, do it today. Would you come? While it's time, don't delay. Place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes to Calvary. We'll sing another verse just for you. You'll come. We'll you keep singing for others. God's spoken to you. And try It is Christ, only Christ, who gives life more abundant, and He calls from Calvary. It was there. I pray that you've not only turned your eyes toward Calvary, but you've opened up your heart to the one who died on that cross for you. God bless you this afternoon and the week until we meet again. I'm going to ask Brother Ray White if he would come down front and center. Would you, Brother Ray, and lead us in our closing word of prayer. While he's coming down, any prayer requests that we might want to share? Brother Joshua. Uh, my family in Memphis, they have COVID also, so I pray and ask that they will uh, heal and get better. Pray for them and others. And my cousins too. Yes. Amen. We all remember Sister Talisa. Remember Brother Bailey Cook. Still in the nursing home. My dad's doing very well. And yes, amen. Brother Reed, amen. amen. He'll be 94 next month. 94. Worse than next month. Amen. He's getting around pretty good. Praise the Lord. And I had a cousin that lost her husband just amen. last week. So amen. It's always sad. Amen. Y'all remember Carla's family. Uh, her mama's, one of her mama's brothers, passed away this week. And, uh, I got part in the funeral in near Athens right after the service today. It'll be at four o'clock. Carla couldn't attend either here or there. So, and that's how many uh, how many y'all met Carla's mama? Neither. Oh, that was okay. it. Yeah, it's uh, brother Bill, Uncle Bill. He was always good and generous to all of them were. And so pray for that family. And I appreciate your prayers that my health might prosper. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Brother Ray, would you come and stand right here, please, sir? I sure appreciate it. And would you lead us in prayer? May we join Brother Ray in prayer. And oh, wait a minute. And don't forget to tell Brother Charlie. It's good to see him. Y'all tell Brother Charlie how much you appreciate it. You really want him to come back? Give him a $100 bill. And... God bless you, Charlie. We appreciate you so much. Brother Ray, would you lead us? My father, we... Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house, Lord, today. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to another year, Lord, to, Thank you, Jesus. to come before you every day to worship, to, to fellowship. Yes, Lord. Lord, that you've given us, we praise you, Lord, for your yes, service, Lord. through all the trials, all the temptations. You've kept us from Thank sickness you, and through sickness, oh, Lord. Thank you've you. covered us, given us health and strength. And so we just praise your name, oh, Lord. We thank you for thank the privilege you, of being able to come into your house, Father, to hear your word from the Lord. Yes, from your servant, Pastor Cook, and we pray, Lord, that you'll grant him recovery, health, Thank and cause you. all his soul to prosper, O oh God, Jesus. in his body and his spirit. Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, for the needs that you've expressed here today, Father. We praise and yes. thanksgiving. Just to lay oh Father, for her father and for her cousin who lost her husband. We pray, O oh Lord, yes, that Lord. you'll be 
strengthen that family, O oh God, and also yes, for the family of Sister Carla. With Sister Talisa, Lord, and her need, we ask, O oh God, that you'll be there, Lord, and you'll be strong and stand for her, Father, through all her trials and tribulations. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for her. For yes, Brother Lord. Joshua and his family and members, yes, we Lord. ask, O oh Lord, that you, your, your hand of healing and perseverance yes, will Lord. be upon them, O oh God. Thank that you'll Jesus. watch over them, O oh God, and keep them for your name's sake. And so, Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done thank for us. Lord. And, Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you dismiss us today in your love. And, Lord, that you bless the, what we will give you, O oh Father, as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen amen. And amen. Please remember also Brother Clint Wentz's cousin, Kevin Wentz. Nephew. Nephew. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay.